Yeah, my name is Rhea Suarez and I am with the Cancer Support Community. Welcome to our webinar, Frankly Speaking About Cancer, Managing Long-Term Financial Concerns, hosted by the Cancer Support Community and sponsored by Onyx and Lilly. If anyone should require technical assistance during the conference, please dial 1-866-229-3239 and click on option number one. So before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's call is being recorded and will, and will be made available on the Cancer Support Community website at cancersupportcommunity.org slash webinars. The format of today's webinar will be as follows. Our presenters will be featured first, and then we will begin the Q&A portion. Thank you to those of you who submitted questions prior to the webinar as part of the registration form. If you would like to ask additional questions, please feel free to type it into the Q&A box on the right of your screen. You can ask a question through the box at any time during the event. At the end of the webinar, you will be redirected to the post-event survey. Please complete this survey as your input is invaluable to us. The survey will only take a few minutes. I'd now like to give just a brief background on the cancer support community. So we are an international nonprofit organization that provides social and emotional support to all people impacted by cancer. In 2009, the Wellness Community and Gilda's Club joined forces to become the Cancer Support Community, and through that merger, we now provide the highest quality emotional and social support through a network of over 50 affiliates, 100 satellite locations, and our online programs as well. Our mission is to ensure that all people impacted by cancer are empowered by knowledge, strengthened by action, and sustained by community. So this slide just gives some of our resources that we have available at the cancer support community. We have our cancer experience registry, our open to options program, our frankly speaking about cancer series, and our cancer support helpline. If you'd like additional information on any one of these programs, please feel free to visit our website at cancersupportcommunity.org or you can call our helpline, which is listed on the screen, at 888-793-9355. So this webinar was developed as a result of findings that we gathered from our Cancer Experience Registry. Our data showed that through this registry, members living with chronic long-term or advanced cancer diagnoses wanted to learn more about ways to manage their long-term financial concerns. Um, so we hope that this webinar will address these concerns um, and we'll be discussing common financial concerns that people with chronic or long-term uh, cancers have. We'll also be talking about unexpected expenses, obtaining prescription medications, getting financial advice or assistance, and coping with financial concerns. It's now my pleasure to introduce our featured speakers, Joanna Morales and Jen Sinclair. Joanna Morales is CEO of Triage Cancer. She is a cancer rights attorney, author, and speaker, and has spent more than 19 years working on behalf of individuals with cancer. Joanna received a Juris Doctor from Loyola Law School, Los Angeles, and received her undergraduate degree from UCLA. Jen Sinclair is the Program Director for for CSC Greater Lehigh Valley. She received her master's degree in counseling psychology from Temple University and has a licensed professional counselor and has been a licensed professional counselor for 10 years. So Jen, it's now my pleasure to turn the program over to you. Great, thanks. So the topic of financial concerns comes up quite a bit during our programs. Uh, the added stress of co-pays and mounting medical bills or the fear that certain procedures won't be covered can cause a great deal of anxiety. There are folks that I've met who have felt very proud about paying their bills on time and have stayed organized for most of their lives, but then found themselves in a tough situation due to an illness and therefore felt anxious about being in debt. 
For some, if they had to stop working, even just temporarily because of treatment, that loss of income really felt like a hard hit to their overall monthly budget. Or if there were financial constraints before being diagnosed, like a loss of a job or a relocation to a new area or divorce, uh, then the added stress of medical debt increased that already existing anxiety. Many of our group members also describe how frustrating that whole process can be, making sense of the paperwork when applying for assistance or searching for resources and then getting discouraged. Some people fear that there aren't enough resources or believe that they wouldn't meet the criteria for assistance. Maybe they started to reach out but felt like they were hitting dead ends and then assumed that there was no help available for them. Facing a long-term illness is difficult enough, and the frustrations around financial matters can compound that. Some may have given up searching for financial assistance before they've even explored all of their options, and unfortunately, maybe never talked to others who could have helped them and given them hope. And I think this really reflects that problem of financial matters being taboo to talk about. It can be a difficult conversation to bring up, and some people are embarrassed, thinking that they might be judged if they admit to being concerned about about finances. Some might think that everyone else must have figured it all out and might sadly feel ashamed if they are struggling to find a way through it all. But when we really start talking openly and honestly, they start to realize that this situation isn't their fault and that it's a common issue for many survivors. So I'm really glad that you all tuned in today because you are making an effort to learn more and do something proactive. And you're fortunate to have an expert like Joanna help you identify and explain resources. And I'd like to turn it over to her now. Thank you, Jen. So a cancer diagnosis can bring with it a variety of unexpected expenses. While you may be focused on the cost of your actual medical care. There may be some additional areas that you might want to think about so that you can best prepare and access resources that may be able to help you. And sometimes you need to get creative with managing long-term financial concerns. Getting help with one area of your expenses can free up funds to, that you can use to pay other expenses. And as Jen suggested, persistence is really the key to getting help. So in talking about different types of unexpected expenses that may come up, clinical trial expenses are one type of treatment expenses. And clinical trials uh, are a part of a research process to determine whether or not there are promising approaches um, to new treatments. And if you're interested in participating in a clinical trial, there are some questions that you should ask to determine which trials are available and the risks and benefits of those trials, but also whether or not there are additional costs associated with the clinical trial. And those costs are going to be dependent on the trial and your insurance coverage. And these expenses are usually not more costly than treatment um, that is not part of the trial, but it's important to ask about these costs before you actually begin the trial so you're not hit um, with the unknown. And under the Affordable Care Act, which is also known as the ACA or health care reform, as of January 1st of this year, insurance companies are required to cover the cost of any routine care that you would have received during standard treatment. For instance, office visits and lab tests. However, some trials have added expenses that aren't considered routine. So, for example, if you needed to get PET scans every month under the trial, um, that might not be routine because maybe the standard of care would only be every six months that you would get a PET, PET scan. And some clinical trials may be out of state, so you may need to travel to participate, meaning that you might have additional transportation or lodging expenses. And if your clinical trial providers are out of network, um, you want to make sure that you know what your insurance will cover and how much. And you should definitely engage your healthcare team to get information about what the clinical trial will include and what the cost might be for you. Some states have additional protections for consumers, so you can also go to your state insurance agency for information about your rates and your options. Um, and finally, if you have expenses that you're having difficulty paying for, there are financial assistance programs that may be able to help with your health insurance premiums, 
your co-pays, your co-insurance amounts, any deductibles that you need to meet, and other treatment-related expenses. And so we've included some of these financial assistance programs like the Patient Advocate Foundation Copay Relief Program, Patient Services, Inc., um, the Health Law Foundation, but also you want to look at um, cancer-type specific organizations, um, such as the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, to see if they have programs that are able to help cover uh, clinical trial expenses. You may also have psychotherapy and counseling expenses that you didn't anticipate, and it's important to get the psychosocial support that you need. Insurance companies are required to cover mental health care as an essential health benefit under the Affordable Care Act. However, insurance coverage is going to vary based on the plan that you have. So it's important to check what your plan charges you for your co-pays, your co-insurance amounts, your deductibles, and your out-of-network costs if your providers are out of network. And you should contact your insurance company or you can ask your healthcare team about whether or not you have to get pre-authorization before you get your care in order for your insurance company to pay for it. And if you need help finding support, you can certainly ask a member of your healthcare team or you can call the Cancer Support Community's Cancer Support Helpline at 1-888-793 9355. There are some other types of often unexpected treatment expenses, um, including private duty care, long-term care, and custodial care expenses. And there's some differences between these types of care. So private duty or custodial care can help you with transportation to medical appointments, help preparing meals, um, activities of daily living, um, whereas long-term care is extended care at a nursing home or some other type of specialized facility. And depending on your insurance coverage, you may be able to get some assistance paying for these services, but there is a difference between health insurance and long-term care insurance. Long-term care insurance generally only covers expenses that aren't covered by regular health insurance, and long-term care insurance generally covers home care, assisted living, adult day care, respite care, hospice care, um, and sometimes Alzheimer's facilities or nursing homes. And Medicaid and Medicare, which are the two federal health insurance programs, both offer some coverage for these types of services, but the rules vary, so it's important to contact either your state Medicaid agency or to call Medicare at 800-MEDICARE, or you can visit Medicaid.gov or Medicare.gov for more information. You may also have a supplemental insurance plan, such as a cancer-specific plan, which may provide some additional benefits in this area. And again, it's going to be a running theme. You want to engage your healthcare team as they may be aware of valuable resources for you. As I mentioned before, getting to and from treatment, whether it's local or cross-country, may pose some challenges and cause additional expenses. For example, if you're not able to drive after your treatment, then you may need some help getting home. Even just paying for parking at your treatment facility can get expensive. And certainly the price of gas can be challenging for everyone. Um, but if you have to travel farther to treatment, the cost of airfare and hotels can also add up quickly but there are some resources that can provide some transportation and lodging assistance. Um, there are some types of health insurance that can actually cover transportation expenses, or again, if you have a supplemental insurance plan, it may cover travel and lodging. And you should also look at national resources such as the American Cancer Society, which provides a transportation assistance program called Road to Recovery and lodging uh, through their Hope Lodges throughout the country. For air travel assistance, there are a few programs across the country, such as Angel Flight, which provide flight assistance to get to treatment. And you want to think creatively again. Don't forget your family and friends who may be able to donate their airline miles or hotel points if you need to travel further.
And certainly while you're in treatment, the world doesn't stop around you, so figuring out how to keep up may be rough. You may need to take time off work or figure out how to balance child care or elder care for a parent. Um, some days you may need help cooking dinner or just cleaning the house. And you may also face some additional expenses with addressing the comfort and cosmetic side effects of treatment. But there are resources to help with all of these issues. Um, to learn more about taking time off work or disability insurance, which can help um, replace your wages if you do need to take time off work, you can visit triagecancer.org or cancerincareers.org. Um, there are also assistance programs, for example, um, Cleaning for a Reason is a program to help people with cleaning their, their homes while in treatment. Uh, utility companies usually have a discount program depending on your income level. So that might be something that's available to you. And for assistance with some of the comfort and cosmetic side effects of treatment, Cancer Care and the American Cancer Society have wig banks that are available to you. And no surprise, we recommend asking your healthcare team about local resources. Um, but the National Cancer Institute and the American Cancer Society both have websites where you can put in your zip code and find local financial assistance resources. And the final area of treatment expenses that may come up is legal expenses. However, there are many programs in the cancer community that can provide information about your rates and options that are free of charge. If you do find that you need legal representation, then lawhelp.org can help you find free or low-cost legal services in your area. Or you can contact your state, county, or local bar associations for referrals to attorneys who can assist you. And now I just want to briefly focus on help obtaining your prescription medication. Most insurance policies include a prescription drug benefit, um, but it sometimes might be managed by a company that isn't your typical insurance company. So you may have a separate prescription drug card that's different from your insurance card. And there are usually rules about which pharmacies you can use or how to mail order your prescriptions. And there may be a different number to call for information about your prescription drug benefits, so do check your insurance card. And as always, when dealing with your insurance company, make sure you're keep, keeping careful notes of all of your correspondence with them. So each health insurance plan has a formulary, which is a list of approved medications that that particular health insurance plan covers. And formulary medications can usually be prescribed without requiring a preauthorization. So you don't have to ask for permission first to get access to the prescription drug. Um, but the insurance company and not your physician decides what's on their formulary. And formularies can change throughout the year. So if your provider prescribes a non-formulary medication, there are some options. So first you can check to see if there's a formulary equivalent. And that isn't something you have to do on your own. You want to talk to your provider to see if they can find out if there's a formulary equivalent and see if they can also help you get your insurance company to actually grant you a special request to cover that particular drug. Um, if an insurance company actually denies your use of a particular type of medication, you can appeal that denial. And in each state, there's a process called independent or external medical review, where if your insurance company has denied a particular treatment or procedure and you believe that it should be covered by your insurance plan because it's medically necessary for you to receive that treatment or procedure, you can appeal outside of your insurance company to an independent review board to ask their opinion of whether or not they think it's medically necessary. And each state's procedures are slightly different, so you would go to your state insurance agency to find out more information on that review process. There are also patient assistance programs to help with the cost of your prescriptions. So assistance may be available to you, even if you don't have a low income or you 
um, don't have prescription drug coverage or even just limited prescription drug coverage. You may also be able to get assistance if you can't afford your co-pays for your prescription drugs. And for those of you who have prescription drug coverage through Medicare Part D and you've hit the famous donut hole, you can also qualify for financial assistance to get access to your prescription drugs. So these are just a few of the potential resources that can help you with obtaining your medications. So cancer care, I mentioned the Health Wealth Foundation earlier, Needy Meds, uh, the Patient Advocate Foundation, and the Patient Access Network Foundation are all organizations that can help you get access to, to patient assistance programs and to provide you with financial assistance to access your medications. So you may also find at some point that you want to get assistance from a financial professional. But if you do, it's important that you protect yourself when choosing a financial planner or even just an advisor. You want to make sure to ask them for their credentials in the same way that you would ask a lawyer to make sure they actually graduated from law school or you'd want to know the credentials of your surgeon. You'd also want to know that about your financial planner or advisor. You want to make sure that they're certified in their area of expertise. And you want to ask them about their experience. Are they familiar with working with someone facing a serious illness? Do they understand insurance benefits? Do they know anything about viaticals or reverse mortgages? Because those might be options that you want to learn more about and you want them to be able to provide you with that information. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Jen. Okay, so Joanna gave us a great explanation and overview with lots of helpful resources and contact information, but let's now discuss some coping strategies. Similar to other emotional side effects, feeling stressed over financial issues can really get in the way of coping with your physical health, and this in turn can greatly impact your quality of life if the financial issues continue to be a problem that's unresolved. Financial strain can also be very distracting. If the worry is constantly in the back of your mind, if you feel stuck, or if you fear that you are never going to get ahead again, without help, you may end up talking less to your healthcare team, or you might become frustrated and agitated, which can then negatively impact your ability to make sound decisions. And that's why it's so important to recognize it, acknowledge it, and speak up. Ask for help so that these issues become more manageable. To better manage the stress, it could be helpful to really identify the source, put the financial issues into categories, so to speak. So that way you can determine what type of help you might need. This can also help you really narrow down the parts of the problem so that you can start to tackle each one. And some of the common concerns have to do with, as Joanna talked about, first work-related issues. So again, someone losing their job or unable to work through treatment or if there was a reduction of hours. Again, for these matters, you can refer to the legal resources that Joanna talked about. Uh, next, making decisions about treatment options is another source of stress. There's new terminology to understand and you might be comparing options and considering all possibilities. This is where a social worker at a hospital or a support group or individual counseling can be beneficial. A cancer support community also has a special program called Open to Options, and it's a question listing service that helps prepare you for a doctor's appointment when you'd need to make a treatment decision. Of course, <clears throat> being physically dependent on others to manage medical demands brings yet another level of stress. Uh, but Joanna did mention some options for assistance in those circumstances, too. So refer to that info about long-term care and private duty. Next, there's often worry over unpaid medical bills and insurance limitations. Again, these are major sources of stress. A case manager or navigator at a hospital, in addition to the organizations that provide some copay relief, can really help. And finally, some basic practical needs that Joanna touched on earlier, such as how to get yourself or a loved one to appointments, or who can watch the kids, cook meals, do housework and yard work. 
these are important concerns to identify so that when people ask, hey, how can I help? You can better be prepared to answer them and delegate specifically what you need. Again, when you organize the financial issues in this way, you can see which ones are more urgent, where you need to direct your attention, and which ones you can seek out some help for. Our primary belief at Cancer Support Community is that people with cancer who actively participate in their recovery and really partner with their healthcare team will improve their quality of life. Being empowered, asking questions, seeking information, this is an approach that helps you feel more in control at a time when things really might feel chaotic and overwhelming. So it's important to give yourself a better sense of control by being assertive and acting as a true teammate with your healthcare providers. Instead of being passive, be proactive. And this might mean that you are asking more questions and giving more details, but that's really okay. It's worth the time and the effort. Your healthcare team might not know the extent of your financial needs unless you let them know honestly. Uh, many hospitals are actually using some type of distress screening in the form of a thermometer scale or checklist. And usually financial concerns are a part of that checklist and scale. So answer honestly and share your concerns as they come up during treatment. If possible, uh, even better, thinking about these financial matters and talking about them early on can be most helpful before there is a crisis. Don't wait until someone asks you. Be prepared to talk about it up front. And even though these concerns are overwhelming, avoiding them will only make the problem bigger. So again, we can't reinforce this enough. Don't be afraid to ask for help. And this can be quite a difficult thing for independent people to do, but it's so important, especially when handling financial issues. So consider all of your resources and include family and friends as well. They could especially help with those basic needs we mentioned earlier to ease the strain and the burdens on the whole household. And I wanted to highlight the role of a caregiver. Many times it is a spouse or the adult children or close family members who really advocate for the survivor. They can help delegate tasks and seek out resources. They also act as case managers sometimes to help their loved ones navigate through the system. I wanted to tell you about one of our group members who talked about just how helpful, helpless she and her husband felt after being denied a new medication. Her husband didn't have the energy to stay on the phone and really press the insurance company for more answers, but she, as a caregiver, was determined, so she called, she waited on hold, waited some more, waited as she was transferred to supervisors who continued to review the physician's recommendations again and again, and she kept pleading their case, and eventually uh, they were able to come to an agreement and grant an approval. So powerful accomplishments can happen when people around you and people in the community really stand by you and offer that help. In addition to family and neighbors, look at the community within your hospital. Many do have social workers and financial case managers. They know how to connect you to organizations that can also offer some support. And they would also know what's local to you. Ask a doctor for a referral. It's important to ease frustration by being hopeful. Uh, you've heard about many options tonight to help you pay for your care, and you are armed now with websites and the names of many organizations that provide support to help you deal with that significant financial matters related to cancer and the life changes that cancer can bring. Other ways you can reduce frustration and enhance your sense of hope are, for instance, seeking out one-on-one -on -one counseling or family and couples counseling. Trained therapists can really help you and your family in many ways, anything from devising budgets to helping you communicate better, uh, becoming assertive, planning for the future maybe, and um, to also you know, be a sounding board and, and helping you have more of those sensitive discussions as you problem solve through this. Support groups can be very empowering as well. Just learning that you're not alone can be extremely beneficial. Many support group members can direct you to local resources, too. I often say that the wealth of information and knowledge from the people in our programs is just amazing. Every time a new person comes into one of our groups, they really, everyone else really surrounds them and makes sure that they have the information they need. 
and the more seasoned long-term group members, they really know where to find free wigs and how to get discounts on important items. You know, they've been through the system and they can help prepare new people for what to expect. If the stress becomes too unbearable and if you're feeling particularly stuck, ask your doctor about whether or not medication for depression or anxiety might be helpful to aid in your overall coping. Also, many survivors and caregivers that we see at Cancer Support Community found meditation and stress reduction classes very helpful in this process. Even if the solutions were slow to come, the relaxation classes helped people feel more refreshed and calm, calm enough to face that next challenge. Expressive arts classes also can be very valuable as an outlet at a time that's really feeling difficult. Finding humor with others who share an understanding can be a helpful distraction that you need as well. And finally, gentle movement classes often help people build strength and stamina and confidence, all very important skills when you need when uh, working through these issues. So here are some great organizations that provide more information and uh, easy to understand practical help. Some on this list have great toolkits. Uh, I've often used cancers and cancer and careers. Um, some also have good manuals uh, that you can download uh, and guides as well. Others have videos that you can watch, so survivor stories as well as tutorials. Uh, Livestrong has has some as well, some, some blogs and some some great uh, information. And at this point, I will turn it over to uh, Raya for questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Jen, and thank you, Joanna. Um, so at this point in time, I will now turn it over to the audience. So if you'd like to submit a question, uh, please feel free to do so through the Q&A box on the right of your screen. <coughs> we'll give a couple of minutes for attendees to submit questions. Okay. Um, Joanna, we have a question for you. Um, I, I received Medicare as a stage four cancer patient. My state, Arizona, does not offer Medigap to people under 65. Would you please offer advice to people under 65 who have cancer and who need to pay for the 20% that Medicare does not cover? Unfortunately, there are limited options because Medigap plans are allowed to decide that they won't cover people under 65 who are otherwise eligible for Medicare because they qualify as having a disability. And so buying supplemental coverage then becomes a problem because Medigap isn't an option. And uh, Medicare paid could be an option to you in, depending on what state you live in and what your income level is as a way to pick up the 20% that Medicare doesn't cover. Uh, some people also ask about whether or not the new state health insurance marketplaces have plans that are available to supplement Medicare, and they don't. They don't offer plans as a supplement to Medicare. They only offer full coverage health insurance plans. So if you are in a position where you don't qualify for Medicaid and you're in Arizona, so that is a state that did expand access to Medicaid coverage, um, so that might be one way, but also because you have access to Medicare because of a disability, you might qualify for the Medicaid program in your state. If you don't qualify for Medicaid, certainly some of the financial assistance programs that we talked about can help to pick up the 20% that Medicare doesn't cover. And I want to point to a resource from the cancer support community that talks about all the things that we've talked about today in significantly more detail. And that's the Frankly Speaking Coping with the Cost of Care book, which is available on the website. Um, and we'll give you that information again later. But the book has a number of resources in the back four different areas. So if you didn't catch it today, um, it's also available in the book on the Cancer Support Community website. But organizations like 
the Patient Advocate Foundation, Health Well Foundation, Patient Services, Inc., um, Cancer Care, some of these organizations can help to pick up some of the treatment-related expenses um, that Medicare doesn't cover. Okay, great. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, we have another question for you. Can patients already diagnosed with cancer get long-term care insurance? I thought this was not available because of the pre-existing condition for long-term care insurance. Please correct me if I'm wrong about this. That's actually correct. So the Affordable Care Act eliminated the ability for insurance companies to deny people access to health insurance coverage um, if they have a pre-existing medical condition. So no matter what your health condition now, you can get access to health insurance coverage if you want to buy it, and you can't be denied. However, that protection only exists in the health insurance arena. It doesn't exist for long-term care insurance or uh, disability insurance or life insurance. And so that's really the idea of insurance is that we get it before we need it, like car insurance. Um, you don't get into a car accident and then call up the insurance company and ask for, for car insurance. So that's why they've continued to allow those restrictions on those policies, even though most people don't really know about those options and rarely have them when they need them. However, once someone's been diagnosed with cancer, um, each insurance company has a different policy about how long someone would have to wait in order to be able to be eligible to buy insurance from that company again. So for example, with life insurance, some companies say, if you're five years out from a diagnosis, then we'll sell you a plan again. But because there's no regulation in these areas of insurance, it's very specific to the policy. So you would have to shop around and see what's available to you specifically in your state. Thank you. Um, so I got a couple of questions here about if the slide deck presentation will be available to participants. Um, this, yes, this will be available. I'll send out an email to all people who had registered. Um, and then I will also send out an email once this is available on our website as well. Um, so I'll send out a PDF document out to everyone. So Joanna, I also have another question here. Um, let's see. I'm extremely concerned that the financial pressures my journey has caused will result in my having to declare bankruptcy. Do you have any suggestions on how to possibly avoid this and or, and or how to survive the process? We know that not every um, financial challenge can be solved with some of the financial assistance organizations that we've mentioned. And sometimes the burden is so great that bankruptcy is actually a totally appropriate option. Um, and if someone were to decide that that's what they needed to do to protect um, their financial health, then you certainly wouldn't be alone because we know that 62% of all bankruptcies in the United States are based on medical debt. And about 78% of people who have to file bankruptcy have health insurance coverage. Um, and so that speaks to something about our health insurance coverage and it not being adequate. And that's one of the things that the Affordable Care Act has tried to address. Um, but bankruptcy is a truly legitimate option if that's what's necessary. But I would say that you want to make sure that you understand the different types of bankruptcy before making those decisions and really being able to weigh your other financial options. So can you get access to a loan from a life insurance policy that you might have? Um, is there a way to set up a fundraiser where friends and family and coworkers can help support you? And there are um, organizations within the cancer community that can help arrange that for you. So Give Forward would be an example um, where they do that online and help you uh, raise funds. But if someone found um, in going through the assessment that bankruptcy was the next step and how to get help with that, um, certainly talking with a financial planner to decide whether or not bankruptcy was the only option left, and then making sure that you talk with an attorney about the bankruptcy process to make sure that you 
crossed all your T's and dotted all your I's. And if you needed a bankruptcy attorney, lawhealth.org could be a resource for you. So if you go to lawhealth.org and plug in your um, county, there would be county-level legal assistance programs available to you. Um, and Law Health covers most states. Um, but you can also get assistance by contacting uh, your state, county, or local bar associations. And you want to make sure that they're certified lawyer referral services so that they can refer you to a number of bankruptcy attorneys in your area, and then you can make the choice. Thanks, Joanna. Jen, we have a question for you. My father has cancer, and I'm concerned that he overwhelmed due to his diagnosis, uh, but also how to pay out-of-pocket costs due to treatment. Do you have any recommendations so that I can help him feel less overwhelmed? Sure. I think that uh, really all of our uh, stress reduction activities at Cancer Support Community can be very, very helpful. Uh, the meditation classes to help give a better peace of mind, um, get him social, um, to, again, feel less alone and less isolated. That's usually a, a symptom of feeling so stressed out is feeling isolated and can, can feel like the world is kind of spinning around and um, that'll help him really slow down and be more in the present to regain a sense of control. Um, if you are not living near a cancer support community, then I would recommend uh, one on one or some some family counseling to to really help uh, you know achieve that sense of 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 hope during that stressful time. Great, thank you, Jen. Um, Joanna, uh, hold on one second. Is there any useful way to get insurance companies to allow treatment from doctors and facilities that are out of network, especially when there are no participating specialists within their network? Actually, that's the key. So anytime you are in a network that doesn't have um, maybe a physician who's an expert in your particular type of cancer or in your particular type of treatment, and you want to go outside of your insurance company network to get care, um, you have to ask the insurance company to see if they're going to pay for it. And they might pay for it at a lower rate. So normally if your insurance company would cover 80% of your expenses in network, maybe they'll only cover 50% if you go out of network. Um, or they might say we won't cover it at all. And so the only way to really make an argument that it's medically necessary for you to go outside the insurance company's network and have them pay for it is to say that there aren't any providers within the network who could provide you with that care or treatment or particular procedure. And so that internal external medical review process that I mentioned earlier is really key to that process. So if you find that your insurance company is saying, no, we won't cover that out-of-network expense, you can appeal the decision. And if your insurance company says no, typically you have to ask them to take a look one more time. And if they still say no, then you can go outside your insurance company to your state independent medical review board and ask them to take a look at whether or not it's medically necessary um, for you to get that care outside of the network and you're not available to you inside the network. So it's, in this particular case, it's about making your best legal argument. So you want as much documentation, um, whether it's from the providers that are outside the network who are offering to provide you with the care. Maybe it's a particular treatment or procedure um, that's newer and only the doctors outside the network are familiar with that treatment or procedure. And so if they've done research on it, being able to provide the insurance company with their research um, so it's really gathering as much information as you can to make your case that they should cover your care outside the network. And so that's the way you're most likely to be successful. But it is about making an argument. Great, thank you. Uh, currently, it is my understanding that there is no money available to help cancer patients pay for PET or CT scans, MRI scans, et cetera. Um, is this correct, and would it be possible to tap the radiation oncology community for funds 
uh, foundations to provide assistance for this. Any suggestions? I'm not aware of any specific um, financial assistance resource that specifically helps cancer patients pay for PET or CT scans or MRIs. Um, and I think actually it's a great idea to try to um, encourage the radiation oncology community to create such a fund and be able to provide that type of assistance um, to the cancer community. But to my knowledge, that doesn't currently exist. But again, it's, it's partly about um, what I said earlier about being creative. So if you can take, you can get assistance with something over here on the left-hand side, you can use those funds that you would have been using to pay what's on the left-hand side and pull it over and help pay the cost of what you have to pay for for your PET or your CT scan or your MRI. Um, so it's about creatively using all the resources that are available and sometimes depending on the time of year or the fund, one fund might not have funds available, but the next one might. And so not giving up and being persistent and trying to access as many resources as possible is truly, you know, it puts an additional burden on you and your caregivers um, to go through that research process, but you're much more likely to be able to get the assistance that you need. Great. Thank you. Um, is there any, I guess going along with this, is there any recourse when your doctor says you need a test like a PET scan uh, but insurance won't cover it? I'm hesitant to go into a large amount of debt but want to get the testing and treatment that I need. I think it's really important to have that conversation with your healthcare team. So anytime a member of your healthcare team suggests a particular type of treatment or test or procedure, it really is important to you as a patient to be empowered and to ask questions and to say, is this really necessary? What does this, how does this help me? Or how does this help the provider make decisions about my treatment? Um, and are there other options that are available that maybe are less expensive but still as effective? Um, and we're, we're definitely a culture that sort of accepts things, um, and we tend to not ask questions of our healthcare team where if we did ask a couple of questions, um, it opens up a dialogue and helps the healthcare providers understand what's important to you and helps you understand what's going on with your treatment and care and can help you make better financial decisions. Great. Thank you. Um, so... If you have any other questions, please feel free to submit them. Um, I'm going to give it two more minutes, and I will pull for another round of questions. Um, we have a question here. This might be something for an oncologist to answer, but wanted to throw it out there. Um, even though I have had MBC for five years, my oncologist said I don't have enough disease in the bones, nor have I exhausted all the treatments to qualify for a clinical trial. Is this true? Is this, Joanna, is this something that you would recommend speaking to an oncologist about or seeking a second opinion? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I'm certainly not an oncologist or a doctor, um, but I think anytime you have questions about your health care, that you, again, talk with your health care team. Um, because if you don't ask questions, you're not going to get answers. And I think a strong part about of being an empowered patient is if you have any concerns or questions that are being unanswered, it is totally within your right to ask for a second opinion um, and to pursue treatment in other areas. So if you are interested in pursuing a second opinion, um, your insurance company may have to pay for that second opinion. So there are some states that require mm -hmm. insurance companies to pay for second opinions. Um, and wh whether or not those opinions are in-network or out-of-network may also make a difference. So. 
it, it doesn't hurt to find out more information. Okay, great. Um, so that is all the questions that we have. Any last minute questions from the audience? Okay. So I just want to end the webinar by saying thank you all so much for your enthusiasm and questions um, that have contributed to making today's webinar a great success. If you'd like more detailed information, Joanna had mentioned our Frankly Speaking About Cancer Coping with the Cost of Care book, which is available to order or download at our order site, which is orders.cancersupportcommunity.org. Um, and you can also feel free to visit our website or call our toll-free helpline at 1-888-793-9355 if you have any additional uh, questions or would like some more resources or information. Again, we'd like to thank our wonderful speakers, Joanna Morales and Jen Sinclair, for contributing their time and sharing this important information with us. And we'd also like to thank our program supporters, Onyx and Lily. So please take a moment to complete our post-webinar survey, which you will be automatically redirected to. It's a brief survey, and we greatly appreciate any feedback that you may have. Thank you so much for your participation.